If this sounds like something you might be interested in, or you might learn a few things along the way, go grab yourself a coffee and a small flat white double shot for me. I'll see you in a sec. One of the, oh, thank you. Very nice of you, thank you very much. Oh, what's this? A chocolate biscuit, I'm sorry. I'm on a diet, I really. Mm. Mm. One of the best sounding amps I ever owned was a Tweed Pro. Hand wired reproduction with a 15 inch JBL speaker. I sold it and that amp is now being used by a very talented young man and I'm sure my amp is much happier doing what it was designed to do. That Pro evolved into the Brownface Pro, and in 1965 it added reverb and was renamed the Pro Reverb. I'm not sure of the year of this one yet, but we'll look at a couple of ways of discovering it. Fortunately, the tube chart is intact and has a two-letter code which I will show you how to interpret. We'll cross-check that date with the transformer codes. Uh, we can't use the speaker codes as the original speakers. Probably Jensen's, maybe Oxford's, don't know, um, have been replaced. Sacrilege, I hear you scream. Fortunately, speakers are one of those 100% reversible mods that you can do without a tech. Just watch your combined impedances and wattages and experiment away. Between you and me, I very much like the sound of creambacks. Not a huge fan of the vintage 30s, even though Carlos and Pete Frampton use them. But really, what would they know? Anyway, the owner of this has reported a loud hum after about one and a half hours. Three of the most frustrating problems for an amp tech are one, intermittent problems. Two, problems that happened after one and a half hours of heavy use. And three, anything to do with a mess of boogie. So what are the common causes of harm that we can look at? Um, now, Americans, please modify your hearing. When I say 50 hertz, you hear 60 hertz. When I say 100 hertz, you're going to hear 120 hertz. Got it. If it's a 50 hertz hum, it's most likely to have something to do with grounding, perhaps the filament ground reference. A 100 hertz hum is often the result of a filter capacitor. So we'll look at that as well. Okay, jargon warning. Non-technical people should now block their ears and whistle. The hills are alive with the sound of music for 30 seconds. Other causes may include severely mismatched power tubes. Most tube amps use a center tapped primary output transformer. When the transformer sees a signal from a push-pull stage as equal but opposite phase, thanks to the phase inverter, a common mode signal on each phase causes equal but opposite magnetic fields to be generated, which cancel each other out. The noise and the hum which was in phase on both of those is now cancelled. But the guitar signal that was out of phase is now flipped to be in phase with the transformer. Uh, this same principle applies with humbucking pickups. We well, may also need to question heat sensitive suspects by applying localised heat with a warm soldering iron or general heat with a heat gun, but we'll, we'll look at that as well. Anyway, enough blah blah, let's get cracking. Okay, this amp, mid 60s, it is not pristine, but it shows 
signs of use with just the right amount of aging. This is just the way I like it. I don't like it to look like a showroom piece. I like us to see an amp that's earned its keep. Let's have a look at the back. Now, for those of you, like me, who love the sound of a twin reverb, but understand that it's impractical in the 21st century, and I loved mine in the, whatever it was, not in 20th century, um, it's just not usable anymore. Uh, this is very close, but much more practical size. It has two 12-inch speakers like a twin reverb. It has a smaller output transformer and power transformer. Still reverb like a twin reverb, but down probably less than half the power because this uses a, um, a tube rectifier, GZ34, which is a very efficient rectifier, but not as efficient as solid state, which we'd see on the twin reverb. That all-important tube chart if you look down here, you'll see two letters, Q, D. Try and remember those, because I won't. Now, if you're not sure how these connections go, take a photograph. Now, there are ways, if you think about it, where they go, because your signal actually goes down to the reverb foot switch, the reverb pedal is going to be the shielded one. The vibrato is just a dumb shorting switch, so it doesn't need to be shielded. So that takes care of that lot. Reverb input is generally red. And if there is no red on the socket, I will put a discrete red dot on the reverb input RCA connector that matches up with the red dot on the lead. The rest is obvious. If you want to mark the others and you, you can come up with some marking schemes of your own, maybe put a black dot on this one or whatever. But if you remember the reverb one has to be shielded, Ugh. then that's probably all you need to remember. A couple of other little things you can do while the chassis is out. I've flipped it upside down to make it easier to see. But you can see bits of vinyl very often just come unstuck. I prefer to glue these down rather than um, use staples. Because staples can actually get in the way when you're pulling chassis in and out. So we don't like that. Also, these uh, mounting holes for that back panel um, have stretched, worn out. So while I've got this amp here, I'm going to just fill those with a little bit of uh, a matchstick and um, some uh, PVA glue. Here's my little bag of matchsticks from my $2 store and my PVA glue. Just give it a little bit of a, a dip in there. Poke that in. <laughs> Pull it out just a whisker. <clears throat> then poke it back in again. Makes it almost flush. And then I just like to give that a little bit of a jab in the middle of the matchstick. So my screw, there we go, so my screw will go down the middle of it. Same with the upper hole. Now while I've got this out, I'm going to get my little paintbrush and dab a bit of contact adhesive. And there. And I'm not going to join these up yet because I want that contact adhesive just to tack off a bit. Cool. 
I'll now do the other side, flip it over, clamp up those loose edges and we'll get on with the repair. Let's see if we can pinpoint the date that this amp is produced. So I've printed this out. It shows the uh, what that code is. So it was QD. So it was April 1967 is when the tube chart was made. So let's see if the other key items exist. As we said, there's no speakers to date. So we'll just have a look at these transformers. That says 606 Schumacher. And that is a number six. And this is the output transformer, which was made in 1966. So six there will mean 1956. Clearly it's not that. Or 1966, more than likely. Or 1976. No, it's blackface, not silver face. So this transformer was made in 1966. Here's the power transformer. Can you see that over there? Yeah, pretty hard to see. But that is also 606 Schumacher. That's hard to read. Yes, it's a 6. So this is also 1966. 40th week of 1966. 40, uh, 34th week of 1966 um, and I can't see anything on the choke there's a shadow of a number there but I can't see it so you always go with the latest date the most recent date in that case we're going to go with the date of the chart stamp which was April 1967. This is a 1967 amp. I think it came out in 1965 was the first year of Blackface Pro Reverb. Okay, let's pop this cover up and see what lies beyond. Oh, Guess what? I think we've just found the cause of the harm. These two um, reservoir caps, the largest ones in there, are in series. And clearly that was not a very good solder joint. And good to see that they've used whoever did this the cheapest capacitors available. And what the hell is that? Oh my god. Well, we didn't have to go very far. Look at this. Oh my god. Why not just remove it and do the job properly? Which is what this amp deserves. So I'm going to remove all of these. Put them where they should have gone the first time. In the bin. Now, here's another little clue. I mean, I remember where these are. But if you don't, just give a, a discreet little thing. Preferably somewhere which will be out of sight of the... Um, oh shit, oh my god, that was a, oh my god, so there was actually no um, filtering of the main filter reservoir, that is astoundingly bad. Well, I don't think we need to go too much further to solve the hum problem, but we will because this amp deserves it. All right, I'm going to now pull these out. I'm going to measure these resistances and just make sure they haven't drifted too far from their specified value. This obviously is going to get replaced. That's just a nonsense. And um, then we'll come back and discuss what I've done. All right, here's our power supply here for the AA165 uh, schematic. Um, I think there's an error here. I think they've made these 
for the, I think it's, I uh, can't remember the number, AA685 or something or like that. I can't remember that number. And so these two resistors here uh, that I call totem resistors because they're one on top of each other serve two purposes. One is they ensure that the voltage across those two capacitors is balanced almost perfectly, if these two are exactly the same, between each other. Why is that important? Notice that the uh, capacitors have got a value of 350 volts and if there is nothing to tie that shared voltage up here um, to split evenly, then it is quite possible, let, let's say for example this is, we'll pick it 400 volts, right? If these are not there, then one capacitor could drift up to over 350 and the other one 50 volts, pop, the one which is over 350 is likely to go. So these serve that purpose to balance those off. Also when the power is, when you power down, it also discharges those two main reservoir caps. And if you leave the standby switch on, as I like to do when I power down, uh, when I say on, leave it connected uh, in play mode, then these two resistors will, will also uh, quicker drive these two down to zero volts as well. All right. Wow, that was a long-winded explanation. So this 220 ohm resistor is now 270 kilo ohms. Let's drift it up quite a lot. And this one, poof, man, that resistor is dead. So there is actually no balancing between the capacitor that was here and here. So one of them may well have gone, exceeded its um, safe value. Then it goes to the choke. From the choke, it should go through a 1K dropping resistor. So it drops the voltage and also oscillates this circuit from this circuit. And then there's another 4.7 between that and there. So this one will go off to the screens. The highest one will go to the B plus through the center tap of the output transformer. The second highest is going to go to your screens and then the other ones will go to other parts in the preamp circuitry and phase inverter. All right, so let's have a look at this. This should be 1K. And I can tell it's not, because that looks like two 820s together. So that's 4.5, and it should be 1K. And this looks like but it's 9.1K ohm, and it should be 4.7K. So those two values are from the AB668. So we're going to restore these back to the 165 circuit, which I like better. They, these two both need to be replaced. These need to be replaced. I'll get on with that now. When it's big blobs of solder like this, I quite often just use my solder sucker, like this one, because it sucks up solder quickly and easily and it would just clog up my powered um, solder extractor. I've got the new capacitors installed and this is how it should be done, fellas. I have the labels pointing upwards so Future Tech can see what capacitors you've put in where. Um, I've put in higher rated or higher wattage uh, resistance, metal film resistors. I would have liked to have had them all grey, but I didn't have a um, grey one in 4.7K, so still the same quality of, uh, of resistor. 
Um, now I decided to go with two 100 ohm uh, caps in series here for our first reservoir cap. And you might be thinking, oh God, yeah, the maximum rating of a GZ34 rectifier is, I can't remember if it's 60 or 65 microfarad. But remember that when you put caps in series, you double the voltage, you add the voltages, so 350 plus 350 is 700, but you halve the capacitances. So this is going to give us 100 um, and 100 will, um, in series, will be 50 microfarad. You might notice I put in a little uh, capacitor here between ground and the highest voltage of the first reservoir cap. And this is uh, 0.01 microfarad at 630 volts. We're definitely not going to see that across here. Um, I'm expecting we'll see something in the order of 450, so it'll be safe. These do all the heavy lifting for the um, filtering of the 100 hertz ripple. Um, but sometimes you get some extra um, stray noise either in the line or around in the air around us. And this will just give that a path to ground where these are less efficient at high frequencies. That's when this one starts to kick in and become efficient. So it'll shunt that high frequency noise to ground. All right, let's flip it over and see what lies on the other side. Here's the internals of the chassis. An initial glance says, oh, it looks quite original. But then you start noticing things. Terminal strip, terminal strip, terminal strip. Um, a few resistors replaced here and there. Still got the original Mallory uh, cathode bypass capacitors. So we need to check these because these are now very old. So I suspect that if they're not leaking, um, their ESR will be too high, which is an indication of uh, upcoming failure. These are generally okay. So we'll see what they're like. Here's where we hope we're going to have no leakage because I really want to keep these blue molded caps in place. We will test them for leakage. But let's have a look at where we have some work to do up front. This is an excellent example of why I don't like these sort of grounding situations. I'm not sure if you can see that grime around that threaded screw there, which is then meant to ground this grimy tag. Look at that. Tell me that's not going to have some resistance. And this is the ground wire going to our main reservoir cap. So I'm going to remove this from there and I'm going to join it with the mains earth ground and we'll put a solder point somewhere there. Won't ever be a problem again. I spoke to the owner about how to proceed with this next stage. Um, if he's a collector, my advice was to leave these um, original Mallory caps in there. It's not critical if they um, fail um, because the amp was still operate, just not operate as it was designed. Um, there's also the matter of these terminal strips here and here. And there was another one somewhere which I can't see now, just a little one. There it is there. And he said, well, what would you do if it was yours, Chris? And I said, although it doesn't look original, if it was mine, I would replace these to get that original sound back, but I would leave those. And he said, well, that's what we're going to do. So I'll replace those and I'll replace the uh, bias component down there. Now, we can't get these double 25 bypass caps anymore. So I've made up a couple of my own. Now, while we have the capacitors out of the way, I just want to measure these cathode resistors and just see um, how close they are to spec. Now, can you see that over my shoulder? All right, you can. This is for V1. Should be 1.5K, 1.7. 
1.7 divided by 1.5, 13%. You see, you don't want them too far away from their design value because as that resistor is higher than its design value, the voltage drop across it will be more, which means the um, relative negative value on the grid of that triad will be greater. So the tube will actually be a little bit more off than design values, but that's pretty close. I'm, I'm tempted to leave that one in. So we're gonna say 1.7 is our minimum. What's that, 1.8. 1.83, man, I reckon that's over. It's 22%. Bugger. Ah, that's just too much. I'm going to replace that one. Just put a little black texture there. All right, let's check these next, this next pair here. This one's going to V2. Should be an 820. I mean, it is an 820 and it is correct. Let's just check that. 1k divided by 820. Well, that'll be about 12%. I'm going to leave that. Now, this one is going to V3, the reverb driver. 2.2, 2.2, that's correct. And it is actually. 2.63. I know this seems a little bit monotonous, but 2.63 divided by 2.2. 20%. See you later. 5, 5.60. Where's our reverb recovery? 8.20. Now this, I think, is a shared cathode. Here it is, see here? That cathode there is shared with this one here and it should be sharing it at 820. It's hard to see those colors, but I'm thinking that looks like 560 to me. Yeah, 560. I might be changing that anyway. This next one is going to V5 and it's at 2.7K. I want to buy 2.7. Whoo, 30% out. You're gone, buddy. Yeah, that's here. That's on the oscillator. Who knows what impact that may have on the oscillator that may not even oscillate. Don't know. But either way, it's way off spec. All right, so my job is replace that. Replace that. Replace that. Our next task is to upgrade the bias circuit. This capacitor is literally falling apart, so we'll replace that. And that resistor is the wrong value. Um, this is in our bias circuit. Let's see. Can you see that there? That's meant to be a... Oops, here we go. No, here we are. This is one we're looking at. The, it should be a 470 ohm resistor. There is a 1K resistor. So I'm going to put that back to the 470. If per chance... I can't get a good bias range with the stock value of 470. I'll go back to the um, 1K that previous tech put in. Uh, once I've got that resistor out, I'm going to check that diode. It's probably okay. But um, if there's any doubt about it, I'm going to switch that out as well. So the um, this is 100 microfarad. Um, the... Uh, circuit diagram shows 25. I'm going. Uh, I think that's too small. 100 might be fine, but um, I'm going to put in a uh, what is this? A 50. I decided to err on the side of caution. They look almost identical, but I decided to replace that um, 
uh, the previous diode with a new 1N4007. Um, that's a one amp diode. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any of my brown Vichy uh, metal film resistors. And um, the one that was in there was way undernourished and the wrong value. It's Anyway, I'm deciding I'm going to use a 2 watt resistor once again, overcompensate. And uh, I just also I'm going to just stand it a little bit off the circuit board. Here we go. And that'll just keep it off the board. If it gets warm, it's got good air circulation around it. The fact that Fender specify it as being a higher wattage is that they're expecting that it may warm up. And they want it to be able to dissipate the heat safely. Yeah, I wish it was brown, but it ain't. It's blue. Stands out a bit much, but I certainly didn't want to go back to using a carbon composition. They just drift like crazy. And that, folks, is how it's done. Try and keep your leads nice and straight. I like to keep the high wattage resistors elevated, let air, circu air circulation around it. And I try and overrate things wherever I can. Like that's got double the capacity, um, yeah, well, double the capacitance in this case, but normally that's a typical value of bias cap. But the voltage is, over is overrated, the wattage is overrated. The um, amperage there, we've got at least double or triple the amount of headroom on that 4007. So that's how it should be. My friend and colleague Brad of Brad's Guitar Garage has this great little expression. I can't remember what it is, but something like when you do your work, leave it as if no one had been there. I like that. I can't remember the exact wording, but that, that was the gist of it. If you haven't seen Brad's Guitar Garage, don't know how you missed it, but excellent channel. Have a look at that. Now we're going to be doing several things at once. So shout out if I forget anything. So uh, I'm going to start ramping the voltage up slowly, the mains voltage from 0 volts to 240 volts. Oh, we're going to check this fuse. As you can see, it is meant to be 2 amps, but that's at 110 volts. So we're at 240, so that should be a one amp fuse. Let's just double check this right now. Good tech should have done that in the past, but good tech forgot a few other things like the power supply. Bad tech that's been in here just did a whole bunch of screw ups. Okay, it's a two amp fuse. Wrong, here's a one amp fuse. Now, you notice that when I wired this, A, I put a little bit of shrink, heat shrink around there just for stop klutzes like me getting zapped. But you put the hot end, so the hot comes straight to the far end of the fuse. So if it blows and you act, when you're unscrewing it, you accidentally touch that thing, you want this bit to be in contact with skin. Oh, hang on, you can't see what I'm doing. You want this bit to be in touch with skin, not that bit. So... Um, just make sure you had the hot to the end and the fused wire there. So one thing we're going to check is I'm going to start ramping that voltage slowly up on the Variac and that's going to be slowly applying gentle wake up voltage to our filter capacitors. We're not going to yell in their ears, wake up, you lazy bastard. No, we're going to, come on, filter caps, up you get. So we're going to see that that gets up to voltage without anything nasty happening. I'm also going to be monitoring my bias voltage to make sure that I didn't do anything the wrong way around there. Because the positive should be going to ground. I'm sure it is, but we're going to check it anyway. And then finally, we're going to be checking these two capacitors, which you can see I've lifted the legs off there. Well, not finally. And that's these two capacitors here. Because on this side of the capacitor, we got 240 volts, 280 volts. And what do we want on this side? Nothing. 
we don't want any of that DC coming across there because if it does, it's going to upset the bias of these. Remember, this is supposed to be negative compared to the cathodes, which are grounded, and they're negative from our bias circuit here, which we have just upgraded. So what I'm going to do is two things. I'm going to check to see that we've got no DC leaking through there, and we'll be using my nifty little leakage tester. If it is, we'll sadly have to change these. Our signal passes through these two blue caps, so we want to retain them if we can. Not so essential on our filter capacitors because their job is to dump AC to ground. It's not to pass AC signal. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed that they're okay. Then I'm going to check the voltage on the two, on the other side of each of these two. Can you see that? I'm going to measure voltage here and here, and they will hopefully be the same voltage as what we're seeing from there, from the bias circuit. I don't want to see a different voltage there to there. We may have um, a problem with these 220s. May not show up because I've got the, for safety, I've taken these two um, 6L6s out. Anyway, one step at a time. Um, I don't know whether you want to hang around for the slow ramp up of the um, AC mains. 240 volts. Okay, we've got 477 on the plate. Grid's got 476. And here's all I want to check the bias voltage. Minus 53.9. Okay, that's looking good. So let's just check that there. Minus 53.9. Minus 53.9. Okay, I'm thinking that these two are going to be pretty well matched. I don't care if they're a little bit out from 220, but they seem to be perfectly matched. Now, let's see what we've got here. Now I'm just going to discharge these capacitors first using my little capacitor discharging tool. Just in case, if, if I've got any residual charge in these capacitors from the plates, I just want to make sure they're gone. And if those caps are not leaking, then that should have hopefully cleared that. So if there's any leakage, my little patented leakage detector tool will now glow green. Look at that. No green glow on that one. That one's not leaking. And that one's not leaking. Woohoo! We get to keep our blue moulders. I'm happy about that. That's part of the sound. All right, so we've checked those voltages. I'm happy with that. Our new filter caps have survived this charge, this power up. The bias circuit seems to be working. I don't know what sort of range we've got yet. I think the book value is something like minus 50. What have we got? Minus 51. So let's just go here. I want to see what sort of range we got. Minus 62, which will be really cold. To minus 47 which is warm. I'm going to set it to the factory value here, a 51, but that's not where we're going to leave it. This is the crudest way of all of setting your bias. We're just going to have that as a rough end point. All right, now I'm going to discharge these capacitors and um, 
then return these back into service. I'm very happy about that. All right, let's just watch. I'm going to leave. So when you power off an app to work on it, or even any time really, I like to leave the standby on because leaving the standby on keeps these totem balance resistors in circuit. And when you power it off, they also become a drain resistor. So let's just watch how fast our drain resistors will bring that value down from 480. And I'm going to switch it off. Oh, sorry about the head. Now that fast discharge is thanks to those totem resistors and the fact that we've kept um, that switch shut. I'm sorry, but this is really shitting me. I, you know, my partner calls me a pedantic, a pedant sometimes, but this is just shitting me. I can't bear it. How can the red wire from your um, power supply go through this thing and come out a blue wire through the heat shrink? It's just shitting me. How can a tech anywhere on the planet not have a healthy supply of red wire? I mean, really? It's just beyond the beyond. So I'm going to replace it with a bit of red wire and red shrink wrap. So at least it won't be quite so glaringly obvious that there was a connection made there. Now, doesn't that look better? You can barely notice it now instead of having that hard blue wire in there. So work like that is purely my decision, not the customer's. So um, I'm calling that pro bono work, even though most, most times customers make 10 times more than me, but that's all right. Some things you just do out of pride. I don't know what this is. Looks like the spillage of something which is stained or something. I might just leave that soak a little bit longer. I mean, if I had an unlimited budget, I would probably remove some things to get better access to this under chassis sorry, under wiring, under component muck that's under there. That one's too hard to get to. There's Joanne's toothbrush, here it is. But to do a really good job is gonna require a lot more time. All right, that will do for this part. Okay, quick recap, more for my benefit than for yours. Um, we replaced that cathode resistor. It had drifted way out. That The cathode bypass caps, in fact, all the cathode bypass caps had to be replaced. Uh, not surprising. It's pretty sad because I love the look of those old um, brown Mallory's. I, re I reckon they look really cool, but they're not doing their job anymore. Thankfully, these were okay. That one was okay, so I've left it in place. I'm not a believer in wholesale replacement of any part, only change what's necessary. Oh, I measured these two, um, and as we thought, um, they had drifted quite a lot. Their actual value is not as critical as the fact that they are close to each other, and in fact, they are very close to each other. Here's that horrid blue wire that's gone. Now discreetly, even the um, heat shrink is discreetly twisted away under there. So I need to just check the screen grid resistors. Oh yes, I also um, permanently set that voltage selector to 240 volts so it cannot be accidentally changed. Right, we're now ready to check the bias. To do this, we're going to input a sine wave Nice perfect sine wave like my drawing at 440 hertz, which is an A, and it's surprisingly high. It's the fifth fret of the high E string. That is the fundamental of the note A at 440. 
Now I've set the bias, I've reset the bias voltage um, to the coldest, which means I'm expecting that we're going to see crossover distortion. And crossover distortion is where one tube turns off before the other one turns on. So there is a point where there's nothing happening. And um, that provides crossover distortion. Nobody really likes that. Ideally, with the measurement we're looking for is the maximum clean signal before clipping. Um, we're not going to go into um, overdrive because then we're falsely reading things. So, but you get a rounding off or a squaring off, I should say, of the higher level. That's when the tube is actually cutting off or when it can supply no more and it is saturating. So we, we, we might see this as well. Well, in fact, we will. I'll show you what that looks like when we increase the voltage beyond its ability to amplify the clean, pure sine wave. You're now going to be closely watching the sine wave as I'm starting to increase it. So we're now monitoring exactly what's coming into the speaker. I'm currently on volume four. And you can quite clearly see the... Um, yeah, I'm actually seeing something else as well. You can quite clearly see the crossover distortion, but what I'm also seeing is quite a big difference between one tube and the other tube. So I tested the tubes on my Maxi Matcher tube tester, and there is a difference of about 16% um, in the plate current readings. That could be responsible for that. But before we go any further, I'm just going to switch those tubes around and see if we get a more symmetric uh, looking curve there. So let me just power that off. It's looking a bit better. <clears throat> anyway, you can clearly see the um, that crossover distortion, right? So now I'm going to start warming up that bias, which means going less negative. Uh, you can't see it here, but I'm monitoring a couple of things. I'm monitoring the output voltage, AC. It is currently sitting at 11.2 volts, AC. Square that, divide it by the 4 ohm load. So it's already putting out 31 watts RMS, even with the bias being so off, I reckon that'll improve slightly. I've got the bias set to minus 61. Remember the schematic recommended 51. Now you just watch that as I start to warm up this bias voltage. See how the sides are getting straighter there. Now, that's looking almost perfect to me. Can you see any crossover distortion? What if I... It's a tiny bit left there. If I increase the volume, I'm now on five. And you can just see how it's clipping top and bottom there. So we don't want to go there. We want to go there. That output is 11.45. The volume knob is on five, 32 watts. I reckon this amp's probably good for 35 watts in brand new condition. So that is pretty darn good for a, whatever it is, 50 year old amplifier. And uh, I mean, don't forget we've got in there some tubes which are themselves not 100%, but good enough to reuse. I don't, I don't like to add to the customer's bill with out due cause. So I'm gonna leave those in for another innings or another year maybe. And I'm happy with that 
um, bias setting there. And pff, I hate it when this happens. Have a look at the voltage that the bias is set at. Really, Mr. Fender? Do you have to show off quite that badly? The schematic says minus 51. I mean, how ridiculously close is that? Doing it the oscilloscope method, which is my preferred method, <laughs> to just setting a dumb voltage. God. I'm going to have a check of the current. It's just... I'm not surprised it happens too often, but I still won't change. I'm still always going to do it my way. This time I'm using my Weber um, bias right. I don't think these are available anymore, but I still like it in, in many applications, especially where the tubes have got those bear claws that come around and grab the, like the, the bear trap sort of thing that comes around and grabs the base of the tube. Because on the Euro tube one, of course, the bear trap, the bear claws have to be exactly where the test cables come out of it. So I don't want to risk damaging them. So this, I more often use the, the Weber bias right because it's just more conveniently located. And I've got um, position A for V7. And I've got position B is going to be for V8. And we need to measure the voltage and current and we'll calculate the power. All right, so V7. Uh, power equals VI, right? Equals 11.7 watts. Also cold. And yet we saw no crossover distortion. And yet we saw a value of voltage very close design setting on the schematic. So I'm going to leave those tubes as they are. Yes, they calculate a little bit cold but I'm confident that it's going to give the tubes a longer life um, because they're not running as near as hot and yet they are clean. If I wanted to take them up a little, I could do that. But I'm not going to go too far away from what we saw as a good value. What if I go up to 26? 26 on one, 28 on the other. Let's just check that highest one. Divide that by 30 watt tube, 42%. Normally I'd be thinking that's cold, but the voltage is right and uh, the oscilloscope signal is showing no uh, crossover distortion. So that's where it's going to stay at that setting. Good. Now I'm just going to um, listen to it uh, because we don't know. I heard one of these tubes has got a bit of a rattle to it. So I'm going to see if we can hear that. I haven't tested the sound of this yet. So let's do that next. Now this amp has got three lovely old American tubes. They look like, they look like they're all RCAs bit faded. It's got that telltale orangey logo. We've got one electro harmonics, a Chinese 12AX7, no 12AT7, and a Fender of in unknown age, Fender tube. All right, so we're going to work on the assumption that his main channel is going to be the vibrato channel. So that's where we want to pick our best tubes. That's our next uh, next mission. So, I'm not sure if you can see this all right, but signal for the vibrato channel goes into V2, obviously, and because it's the first tube in the line, that's where we're going to put in our best sounding tube. Then that signal goes through the tone stack, out of that, the half, this half of a 7025-12X7, there's the other half of it down here. So the reverb recovery, um, which normally I wouldn't put in the greatest tube, is important because it's going to this tube and that's our second gain stage in the line. So that is very important. So that's where we'll put our second best tube. 
and then we have takeoff from after the tone stack recovery stage there is going into the 12AT7 that's an I don't really care level too much it's relatively minor I would rather keep the better 12AT7 for there um, the reverb recovery as we said is a good needs to be good because that needs to be good and from there it goes into the 12A T7. Now we also have the oscillator down here and it doesn't need to be anything special. So that's where you'd put in a noisy, microphonic, I don't care what sort of tube it is. All it's got to do is go whop, 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 whop and flash that uh, um, opto coupled resistor on and off and that will then, it comes into the phase inverter there. All right, so let's just see which ones of these are microphonic or not. I think it's, well, it's hard to tell because the vibrator channel's got a bit more gain. What was previously in the oscillator, gonna put that in there. Yep, that's quiet. So that's definitely staying there. And 12x7. Well, he can go in the oscillator. He's probably too good to go in the oscillator. But I don't want to make the owner buy another another tube if it's not necessary. Now the question on everyone's lips is does that Chinese 12AT7 stay in the phase inverter? I'm going to try a JJ12AT7. If I can't hear an improvement I'm going to put the Chinese one back in. It's definitely got to be a sonic improvement or it's a no-go. Oh, look what I found. In my little secret stash, I found an NOS Philips brand new box condition. I'm gonna see if this sounds better. It should. <laughs> Sounds pretty bloody good. Now, without changing any setting, I'm going to put the Chinese one back in. And if I don't hear a noticeable deterioration, we're going to stay with the Chinese. Slightly sweeter, but would will a customer hear it and appreciate it? Because it's going to cost them a fair whack. Definitely sounds better, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with the sound of that Chinese tube. So what I've done now is I've put the Fender labelled um, tube in the phase inverter position and the Chinese one in the reverb driver. All right, that's the way it's staying. I'm gonna leave that Fender labeled one in the phase inverter. I like it better than the Chinese one, which is now doing the lesser important job in the reverb driver. I'm now gonna number these tubes. So I've now la labeled all the, the tubes from one to eight. I might as well put a nine on the rectifier, so. Full set, there we go. All right, I'm now going to take all the tubes out, give the contacts in the tube sockets and bases a bit of a clean, and um, then I think we're pretty much right to hear what it sounds like in its own speakers. I am really excited about hearing this. This is my kind of amp. Blackface, Fender, 
spanky cleans. Man, this has got it. Forget your Kempers and your Helixes. They don't come close. This has got something in that top end, that shimmer, that compression in the high frequencies that only a great valve amp can do. And I'm hoping you're going to hear it in this demonstration. So what's going to pair up well with a 1967 Fender Blackface amp? Got it. A 1968 Fender Telecaster, of course. They may have even played together. Oh, no, they didn't. I brought this one over from America. This one's from Florida. I've got the volume set to four. The treble on nine. I like it trebly. But the bright switch is off. Uh, bass is on four. Reverb I've got on two, so it's barely going to be ticking over. Uh, no vibrato. So what am I going to play? Well, when I think of tellies, spanking clean tellies for a Fender amp, I think of this guy, uh, you, you wouldn't have heard of him outside of Australia. Look him up, Mark Punch. Great telly player, great telly sound. And I think the first song that I heard him play uh, would have been about yeah. this big. Um, was a song by, uh, no, Dilbert, Cuthbert, I can't, can't think of the guy's name now, but uh, it was a great cover done by an Australian singer called Rene Gaia, who we just lost a couple of months ago. <clears throat> so um, I think I might try and play you a little bit of that standing on shaky ground that Mark Punch did so well. This is where you wish you had a great bass player. I got to play with Harry Bruce, probably Australia's greatest funk bassman ever. And uh, once I got to play with him, what a memorable night that was. Um, but sadly, I haven't got Harry here, so you're just gonna have to put up with me. you could hear that. seeing you at the next repair video. wonder what it's going to be.